Okay, so just to say thank you to everyone for joining. Apologies that we're a couple of minutes late in starting. Um, welcome to Doughty Street's Court Protection Seminar Series. And today will be Oliver Lewis, who's presenting on uh, learning disability, coronavirus um, and international human rights. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, you are muted and your cameras are off. I'm afraid that that's our um, pre-chosen settings just to avoid any feedback but there is the ability to use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen on the toolbar. Um, if you send through questions and answers, we will deal with them at the end if we have time. And if for any reason we don't have time, um, then Oliver will um, deal with them in email format. I'll make sure that that happens. Um, there's also a raise hand function, but we're asking that you use the Q&A if possible to deal with any issues um, so that Oliver and I can pick up on them. I'll be sitting in the background trying to help with some of the tech <laughs> as best as I possibly can. Um, but I will pass over to Oliver now uh, to lead the presentation. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. So my name is Oliver Lewis. I'm a barrister at Doughty Street, um, specialising in the rights of people with disabilities and in particular those with learning disability, autism, dementia or mental health issues. Um, and a piece of relevant biographical information is that before returning to the bar around um, three years ago, um, for about 15 years, I lived and worked in Budapest, uh, leading an NGO which um, focused on the rights of people with mental health issue, issues or learning disabilities across Europe. We did a lot of strategic litigation and advocacy at UN and Council of Europe bodies, so I hope to share some of um, uh, the learning around how international human rights bodies work with you today. I know that there are um, over 200 people on the call, people from Kenya, Australia, um, Canada, uh, and even um, places like Milton Keynes and, and even East London. So welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, this seminar has been billed as uh, a focusing on learning disability, but actually it's going to be a bit wider than that. It'll be relevant to those um, working on the rights of people with uh, dementia, mental health issues, autism, and so on. And I'm going to use the phrase people with disabilities because that's what the international disability community uses. Uh, and I do so, of course, recognizing that um, everyone is unique and has their own experiences, wishes, feelings, needs, and so on. I'm gonna make this PowerPoint available afterwards, so there's no need to take notes. I'm also gonna tweet the presentation um, uh, afterwards, um, but p please feel free to um, tweet as we go along. Um, you can see what we're gonna discuss in this slide, so um, let's jump in. So it's my aim that by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to identify um, relevant international human rights standards um, and use them in UK proceedings to advance the rights of people with disabilities in the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I realised that um, today there is an international audience, um, so if you'd like me to do a, another maybe adapted seminar for, for you and your NGOs and the people that you work with, um, please let me know. But we're, we're going to focus on how to use um, international legal standards in UK um, litigation today. But before we do that, four bits of context. Um, first thing to say, I think, is that people with disabilities face exclusion and discrimination across the board, including in employment, education, and importantly for today's purposes, healthcare. Um, and access to healthcare and the capacity of health systems is a heightened concern now for people with disabilities, um, many of whom are already living in poverty or experiencing income inequality, especially as the pandemic brings additional economic risks for low income and less secure workers. Um, and many people with disabilities um, can be described if they do have employment as being in low income or, or less secure employment. There are around 1 billion people with disabilities in the world. That's 15% of the world's population. 80% of people with disabilities live in developing countries or low and middle income countries. But even in high income countries such as the UK, there's a bi-directional link between disability and poverty. That means that in many cases, disability causes poverty. And for other people, poverty gives rise to disability. We're living in an aging society, obviously, where people are living longer, 
that's good, but it also means that people um, have long-term health conditions or disabilities. Uh, and the International Disability Rights Framework, which we'll talk about a lot, um, embodied in the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, the CRPD, is now more relevant than ever before. And it's especially relevant for our discussion today, um, given that um, in the UK, there are around 11,300 care homes for elderly people, older people, um, which have about 410,000 uh, residents. F um, sorry, 400, yeah, 410,000 um, residents. That figure doesn't include younger people um, with disabilities or people living in mental health facilities. Lastly, in terms of context, the CRPD um, is um, founded on the principles of equality, autonomy, inclusion, and participation. And those four principles are useful lenses um, when we're looking at a situation uh, like um, the coronavirus pandemic in the UK. And those are also important principles to bear in mind when we're developing tools um, for those whose rights are affected and they're important principles to come back to in making demands to the duty bearers in international law. Um, that's the organs of the state. Um, <clears throat> so much for the principles. Um, look at this horrific slide with so many uh, lines of text. Very bad example of a PowerPoint slide. But this is a list of all of the documents that the international human rights community um, has produced in relation to people with disabilities and human rights and coronavirus. Um, so 17 documents produced from 13th of March. The latest one I could find is from the 9th of April. Um, 13th of March, that's a month and a day ago. Doesn't that seem like a long time ago? I'm not gonna describe each one, but I just want to give you a sense of how these were developed. It's interesting that on the 16th of March, that's the second document, several UN special rapporteurs published a joint statement about the coronavirus crisis and human rights. Um, they did not include Catalina de Vandas, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the next day, she fired back by issuing her own fierce statement, pointing out that, quote, little has been done to provide people with disabilities with the guidance and support needed to protect them during the COVID-19 pandemic, even though many of them are part of the high-risk group, end quote. She said that, quote, people with disabilities have been left behind, end quote. That was a message for governments, of course, but I suspect it might also have been directed to her fellow UN special rapporteurs. So the sources, the list contains that tension of regular human rights bodies issuing statements about all people, but neglecting to mention people with disabilities at all. Uh, the worst culprit of that is WHO Europe at number seven in this list. Some of these documents focus on, for example, places of detention, which we'll look at later on. Some on other places such as long-term care facilities um, and some include people with disabilities in a, in a really smart way. Um, and some include older people. Um, and some of these statements focus on, on people with disabilities. Uh, another way of categorizing these statements is, um, as I've done here, which is to list them within United Nations at the top, Council of Europe underneath, and the various bodies there. Um, again, you don't have to make notes. We'll send this round afterwards. Um, but all of these statements are potentially relevant for COVID-19 related uh, litigation and, and legal advocacy in the UK. I would also encourage you to look at various NGO statements. Here are three uh, from the Inter International Disability Alliance, for those who don't know, is the global umbrella body of regional disability organisations, um, uh, as well as global impairment specific organisations. Um, if I can use that phrase, like Inclusion International or the World Blind Union, for example. Um, I'm not going to take you through each of those statements. Um, you can find links to them on a blog that I uh, 
wrote on the 21st of March, which I've been keeping updated um, whenever a new statement is issued. Uh, and if I've missed anything um, in this list, pl please send me um, information about what I've missed and I apologize in advance. So those are the kind of sources. We'll send those to you afterwards. You'll have a complete list. Um, but why is all of this so important? Well, the reason that it's important is because people with disabilities um, and older people are at an increased risk of contracting this infection. And if they do contract it, they are at an increased risk of having a more severe form. At the global level, the reasons for this are the following. First of all, there's a limited availability of disaggregated data. What that means is that surveillance systems set up at the national, subnational, and also international levels are unable to determine the impact on people with disabilities and to make adjustments to the measures that um, governments and other bodies put in place. We know from the news over the past 24 hours in the UK that there's a significant lag uh, on the death numbers um, in care homes. Uh, and there's actually no data on the numbers of people in care homes um, who have been infected, partly because um, there's no testing. So if you can't, if you don't test, you don't have the data. Second reason um, why people are more, people with disabilities are more at risk is because of inaccessible information and communication. And what that means is that people with hearing or visual or intellectual or physical disabilities may not receive key information about prevention and assistance. We'll look at information accessibility in a moment. Um, another reason is that accessing essential health services and WASH facilities, WASH stands for water and sanitation for health, is essential. And this includes all sorts of things like the, the availability of drinking water, sanitation, including access to a toilet, and other things like healthcare waste management. Hygiene includes hand hygiene, running water, soap, and environmental disinfection, and management of the supply of those things. People with disabilities face barriers, including the physical environment, lack of accessible public transit and private taxi systems, limited capacity of health workers to communicate and work with people with disabilities, and in many countries, although luckily not in this one, high costs of healthcare exacerbated in some contexts by more limited access to insurance. Um, another key factor which we'll come back to is that many people with disabilities unfortunately live in congregated care facilities in institutions which increases their risk of infection and many people with disabilities in institutions and in the community rely on physical contact with the environment or support persons in their day-to-day -day activities and as is now well known physical proximity increases the risk of infection Disabled people have a higher risk of a worse outcome um, due to comorbid comorbidities relating to um, conditions such as respiratory disease, heart disease, um, immune system issues, diabetes um, and obesity. Um, so just to take stock where we are, we've got to number five. So now we're going to get into the bulk of the presentation, um, which is looking at four human rights issues. Uh, information accessibility, distancing, um, institutions, and discrimination uh, in healthcare. So let's take the first one. But whatever their disability or means of communication, uh, everyone is entitled to information about coronavirus. And there's a whole area of expertise about how to communicate effectively, how governments should communicate effectively. Quite relevant, I would suggest, in the UK. I've given you one resource at the top there. Um, if you Google that, you'll be able to get the report. Um, and the, the whole kind of sector of public health communication has learned a lot from the response to Hurricane Katrina. And scholars uh, looking at that have highlighted the importance of addressing the risk communication needs of various groups of, of people with disabilities. And that relates to receiving information about an outbreak uh, of a pandemic, planning for adequate supplies if social distancing is implemented, and anticipating and arranging contingency plans for continuity of care and support, uh, which might be disrupted um, due to family members or friends or paid carers 
um, being ill or otherwise unable to work. Um, so what have the human rights bodies said about that? Well, the starting point on accessibility is Article 9 of the CRPD. Um, that's not a right, uh, but an anticipatory duty. Uh, in other words, states have an obligation when putting out important information that the information is accessible to groups of people. Uh, the government doesn't need to know the specific individuals, but it needs to know that in their country, there'll be a bunch of people who are blind or have visual, visual disabilities. There'll be a bunch of people with learning disabilities who require easy read and so on. And in its general comment number two, the CRPD committee, that's the UN monitoring body, um, emphasized the need for healthcare services and information to be accessible to people with disabilities, including for those with low or no literacy. Um, and several of our 17 uh, COVID-19 relevant documents stress the need for information accessibility, including captioning and signing for televised announcements and press conferences, easy to read and plain language documents for people with intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, digital tech like websites and apps need to be accessible to people with vision, hearing, learning and other disabilities. Text messages should be used. Uh, if there are telephone based services, they should have text capabilities for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And UNICEF and the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child have both made the point that information should be age appropriate for children with disabilities to help them take steps to protect themselves and their families. Uh, and many of the documents um, raise a non-disability specific point, which is that information must be transparent and free from bias. So let's just look at that and see how the UK is doing. So on the left is the government website about um, residential care, supported living and home care. It's the page which you, if you're a worker or if you run a care home, or if you're a person in supported living, you would go to this website to find out information um, relevant to you. There is no easy to read information on the government and website. And in fact, um, even if you don't have a learning disability, many of these documents are, can hardly be described as easy to read or easy to understand. We'll look in a moment about how um, non-specific and how unclear some of this guidance actually is. In the middle, contrast um, the uh, contrast the two images. Uh, in the middle is the front cover of a book, an easy read book by Beyond Words, um, which was a, a charity established by Baroness Sheila Hollins. They've got four easy read books about coronavirus, which they've made available for free download. And I recommend that you download them and share them. And on the right, there's a list of um, organizations which have produced easy read information um, I'll share those links afterwards. So that's it for information accessibility. Um, let's turn to distancing. It's been suggested that um, social distancing is actually the wrong phrase. And while of course we must keep our bodies apart from others, we needn't be distant from each other in our hearts and minds. And this is particularly important for people with disabilities who may already be segregated or isolated from the community. And so perhaps physical distancing is a better phrase. So the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina Devandas, has observed how distancing and self-isolation may be impossible for those who rely on the support of others to eat, dress and bathe. She's called for states to put into place financing measures for people with disabilities um, and so those include prov provision of care, including relatives who may require reasonable accommodation uh, to provide support to people with disabilities during this period. So I find it interesting that she's um, framed the needs and the, the potential to inject financing into this whole sector. Um, at, she's framed that as, a, as the right to non-discrimination, um, which, which obviously where a, a failure to um, provide reasonable accommodation constitutes uh, discrimination which is unlawful per article 5 of the CRPD um, and you can look at the definitions of both discrimination and reasonable accommodation in article 2 of the CRPD. 
Several bodies have called on states to put in place the means for disabled people to effectively practice physical distancing, including financing, as mentioned. Um, and in this country, there have been changes to the benefit system, which I won't go into now, um, which seek to uh, alleviate the problems that people with disabilities face. Um, but in my view, it's unlikely that the measures already put in place will be sufficient um, for many people. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has said that confinement may expose children to increased physical and psychological violence at home or force children to stay in homes that are overcrowded and lack the minimum uh, conditions of habitability. Um, they've said that children with disabilities and behavioural problems, as well as their families, may face additional difficulties behind closed doors. Well, Article 16 of the CRPD is worth uh, reading in full. It sets out a whole range of measures that states need to take to prevent, identify cases of and react um, to all forms of exploitation, violence and abuse. Um, unfortunately, all over the world, and I've looked at um, numbers in China, Italy, Canada, Brazil, and they're all reporting now a pattern of increasing abuse and domestic violence. Um, elder abuse is also increasing. There's also now a new startup industry of COVID-19 fraud and scams um, and some people with disabilities will be less able um, to deal with this and if, indeed other people with disabilities, some people with learning disabilities will be more susceptible um, to these, these fraudsters. So let's move on to um, a, a topic which everyone is incredibly concerned about and that's long-term care facilities and by which I mean um, any institutional like setting. So that includes mental health units like assessment and treatment units, um, larger group homes and even smaller supported living placements where there's more than one resident um, and they're cared for by a, a small cadre of personnel. Um, a few moments ago we looked at how people with disabilities were especially vulnerable to contracting coronavirus. And one of the factors was that people live in congregated care settings. Um, and as mentioned in the UK, over half a million people, that's including older people and people with disabilities, live in such settings. One of the issues which has um, come out, come to the fore now, but we've known about for a long time, are workforce issues in these settings. Um, and the fact that there's a massive, um, shortage of care workers. Uh, it's estimated that there are 7.8% um, 7 of the roles in adult care are vacant, 122,000 vacancies. And then now what's happened is that we've got all these um, problematics uh, with, with regard to the um, mostly fantastic people who work in care homes. So carers in care homes may have, of course, coronavirus and be unable to work but they may also have symptoms and they think they have coronavirus, but don't know because there's no testing and don't work. They may be disinclined to work, especially those who are living in multi-generational households. They don't want to place themselves at risk. They don't want to risk infecting their potentially older parents, certainly older than them, potentially elderly parents who may be living with them. They may have children who need homeschooling. So the calculation may be to go to work to earn not very much money at all and at the same time putting the family at risk and not being able to homeschool or stay at home where it's clearly safer and um, somehow get by financially or perhaps not get by. And that's an incredibly difficult and personal choice for people and their families to make. And I think we're going to see numbers of care workers drop even further because of those difficult choices that they have to take. But even if they do go to work, they may be agency staff working across several sites. They may be unaware vectors for infection as they're not provided with adequate PPE. And by the way, when researching for this webinar, I discovered that it was only on the 2nd of April that the UK government updated its guidance to include a recommendation of washing one's forearms where the forearms have been exposed or may have been exposed to respiratory droplets or other body fluids. 
2nd of April. Carers may also have doubts about um, their own competence and knowledge of and preparedness generally. And um, part of the reason for that is because of the uh, non-clarity in the advice that the government's giving them, which we'll come on to in a minute. So what have um, human rights uh, bodies said about that? Well, obviously, um, uh, um, just before coming to that, just to um, give you some uh, figures on the emergency in care homes. We know from um, news reports and data that um, in Ontario, just to give an example, half of all deaths from COVID-19 are in long-term care facilities. In Israel, according to data published last Friday, a third of all deaths are. So I think we're seeing drastic under-reporting of deaths in the UK. And of course, yesterday, the Times reported that um, 15 people have died in a care home in Luton, 16 have died in a care home in Glasgow from COVID-19, that is, eight in Dumbarton, six in Liverpool, um, four in a care home in Portsmouth. And there's news um, all the time now of um, the deaths. It was announced this morning that deaths from COVID-19 up to week 14, which is Friday 3rd of April, um, uh, uh, that there were 217 deaths in care homes um, and 136 deaths in private homes, 33 in hospices, um, compared to 3,716 um, in hospital. But obviously those figures are ancient history by now. Um, and political leaders are calling on the government to do a better job uh, on closing the, the lag of reporting. Care leaders are saying that they're being left on their own and they're bracing for a tsunami um, and that the people who've died are being airbrushed, that's their word, out of the national picture. So there clearly is a human rights emergency, um, in my view, in care homes. Um, and people aged 85 and over represented 59 percent of the older care home population according to the 2011 census. So we've got lots and lots of quite elderly people in care homes and a human rights approach in my view can help us and the government focus on priority measures and if there's one thing that advocates, solicitors, barristers and so on can do now in this crisis it's focusing on this issue. I'm not suggesting that we put a bin liner over our heads and march into care homes. And I'm not suggesting that litigation is the best or the only approach to take in a humanitarian crisis. But in my view, lawyers need to be out there in the public domain, helping policymakers, asking those difficult questions, contacting our clients in care homes, challenging the companies who run them when they aren't doing the right thing, defending the employees who uh, want to blow the whistle helping families think through how to get people out and so on. Of course, the best time to have done all of that was around a month or more ago. Um, but the second best time to take those sorts of actions is today. And on the, in the distant past of the 25th of March, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Michel Bachelet, predicted um, that the virus would rampage through long-term care facilities. She called on governments to address the situation um, so let's look at what the international standards are and highlight some of the ways the UK government's policy response may be falling short and may be breaching Article 2 of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, um, as well as Article 10 of the CRPD, the right to life. Um, so a really important document is the Committee for the Prevention of Torture document um, from the 20th of March. The Committee for the Prevention of Torture, CPT, is a Council of Europe body. Uh, Council of Europe, obviously, is unrelated to the European Union. The UK is still a full member of the Council of Europe. The CPT carries out regular visits to places of detention across the Council of Europe's 47 member states. And it does so in order to prevent uh, the occurrence of torture, inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment. In other words, to prevent Article 3 ECHR violations. And uh, as we'll see a, a bit later, the European Court of Human Rights has in many cases relied uh, 
on the CPT standards and reports. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, or not a couple of weeks ago, on the 20th of March, the CPT issued this statement of principles relating to the treatment of persons deprived of their liberty in the context of the coronavirus disease. Um, and the principles include, you can see them there, the following. Um, first one's really important, I'm gonna dwell on that. WHO guidelines on fighting the pandemic, as well as the national health and clinical guidelines consistent with international standards, must be respected and implemented fully in places of deprivation of liberty. Deprivation of liberty mean, includes uh, prisons and uh, police stations, Im immigration detention centers and so on, but also obviously includes psychiatric hospitals, social care homes um, and so on. Uh, other recommendations include screening for coronavirus, um, providing meaningful human contact every day, even in lockdown, and finding alternatives um, to uh, deprivations of uh, liberty. I want to address the first of these and then we're going to come back to the last of them. Um, so under the rubric of IPC as the WHO calls it, infection prevention and control. Um, so recall that the CPT, which is the Article 3 police, um, connected in with the human rights community has said that, in, that the states must follow WHO guidance. Well, coincidentally, the next day, the WHO um, published guidance um, uh, on COVID-19 um, in long-term care facilities. And that document is well worth reading. Um, it has three aims, to prevent a vir the virus from entering the facility and then if it's in the facility, to prevent it spreading within the facility and to prevent it spreading outside the facility. Um, I'm not gonna take you through this quite detailed guidance, but I'm just gonna highlight a few areas where the UK might be um, falling short uh, or, or from the, um, or not complying with uh, the WHO guidance. So the WHO says that people have to wash their hands with soap and water for 40 to 60 seconds. Um, but the UK government says that um, you can do it in 20 seconds. So on the left hand side, the WHO, um, that illustration is taken from a 264 page document, which refers to several scientific studies about the effectiveness of hand washing and the various, if you do it for 15 seconds, you get this result. If you do it for longer, you get this result. The scientific studies um, showing the efficacy. Uh, and yet the UK is telling its population um, that 20 seconds is okay. Now, obviously I'm not an expert in this, but when I compared the two, I thought, what, why, is, why has the UK government chosen um, to recommend people to wash their hands for 20 seconds. Maybe there's some scientific evidence behind that. And if there is, I would expect the UK government to explain it, but they haven't. Um, here are some more um, differences. So on the left-hand side, you've got the WHO, and on the right-hand side, you've got the UK government's response. And we're just looking now in, at the guidance for long-term care facilities. So obviously the UK um, the authors of the UK document had read the WHO guidance because they copied and pasted some of the wording, right? So the first one, alternatives to in-person visiting should be explored, telephones or video, plastic or glass barriers between residents and videos, exactly the same wording in each document. So uh, plagiarism, in, in my view, if you're seeking to meet WHO standards should be applauded. Um, but there are differences as well. So while the WHO says that um, for residents with no symptoms, meals should be staggered uh, or meals should be provided in the bedroom, um, in the UK version, there's no guidance about that at all. Um, the WHO says that even for residents with no symptoms, there should be a one metre distance between the residents. But the UK guidance doesn't say anything about one or two metres but says everyone should follow social distancing measures. It then adds where possible. And if I was a care worker in a care home or a resident for that matter, 
I think I would be confused. Um, and that's a hyperlink there. So if you click on the hyperlink, it takes you to the social distancing web page. Um, and that web page tells you to avoid contact with someone who's displaying symptoms of coronavirus. Um, but you, you don't necessarily know whether you, you're meet, you as a carer are having contact with someone with coronavirus because um, there's no testing. Uh, it tells you to avoid non-essential use of public transport where possible. It tells you to work from home where possible. And it tells you to avoid large and small gatherings in public spaces um, because infectious infections spread easily in closed spaces where people gather together. And just as a reminder, you're reading this in a care home. The only reference to distance in that document, the UK document, is the advice that you can go out for a walk or exercise outdoors if you stay more than two meters from others. And again, that's the advice for people working and living in care facilities. But it goes on. WHO says that if a resident is suspected to have or is diagnosed with COVID-19, the following steps should be taken, including place a medical mask on the resident and on others staying in the room. Place a medical mask on resident. In the UK, there is no such requirement. It's only when transferring symptomatic residents between rooms that the resident should wear a surgical mask. The WHO says when providing routine care for a resident with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, contact precaution and droplet precautions should be practiced, and that includes goggles or um, a face uh, eye protection, which is goggles or a face shield. Now, the UK doesn't bother with any of that. For eye and face protection, the worker is told to risk assess sessional use. And the hyperlink there goes to a one page table. Um, you can see that we're, the left hand arrow is what we should be looking at. And the right hand arrow there is pointing towards uh, the lack of a green tick. Um, everywhere else has a green tick where something is advised. This has no green tick. The footnotes there say risk assessed Risk assessed use refers to utilizing PPE when there's an anticipated or likely risk of contamination with splashes, droplets, or blood or body fluids. Again, if I was a worker in a care home, I'd be really confused about this. We know that you can contract COVID-19 through the eye. So in failing to meet basic WHO advice, is the UK government placing the lives of care workers at risk? Why isn't there a green tick in that box? Again, I'm not an expert on these issues, but just asking um, some maybe awkward questions. So I hope that's given you a flavor of um, some of the differences between WHO guidelines and, uh, and the UK guidelines. I want to move on to um, another topic in relation to care homes, and that's getting people out. As a country, in my view, we need to be taking urgent steps to reduce the congregated care population. In relation to prisons, Public Health England and the prison service have warned that 15,000 prisoners need to be released to protect prisons from the spread of coronavirus. Where is the similar call for action with regard to care homes? The CPT has said that concerted efforts should be made by all relevant authorities to resort to alternatives to deprivation of liberty. That includes an effort to reassess the need to continue psychiatric detention, transfer people out of social care facilities into community care um, and um, all relevant authorities therefore clearly includes uh, local authorities, um, CCGs, uh, NHS England and, and whoever else the commissioner might be. More recently the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the UN Special Envoy on Disability and Accessibility have called on states to accelerate measures of deinstitutionalization of persons with disabilities from all types of institutions. Look, obviously, getting people out of care homes is difficult in ordinary circumstances, and all my court of protection colleagues know that. Um, but we need to act quickly. Uh, in these circumstances, in my view, perfection is the enemy of the good. Um, so we, in my view, need to be calling on local authorities to 
write reasonable care plans and transition plans which don't have to be perfect simply to move people out into safer places um, if there's evidence that the care home from which you're trying to move people um, isn't one of those care homes which uh, have had a coronavirus infection. Um, but we shouldn't be left with the impression by the media that all care homes have infections. Only a small percentage, as far as I understand, only a small percentage do. Um, in my view, we need relief funding and targeted investment in home care. We need to focus on the principle of having one carer per person at home. Surely, in terms of surviving coronavirus, is better than being in a congregated care setting where you're looked after by multiple carers. And indeed, those multiple carers may be working in multiple care homes. For those um, lacking in capacity, the Court of Protection can help get people out. Um, the person making the best interest determination, that could be the court, has to obviously, per section 4.2 of the Mental Capacity Act, has to take into account, has to consider all of the relevant circumstances. Um, and in my view, best interest decisions can, and in, in many cases should, be reopened because uh, COVID-19 is a relevant circumstance which was, if the best interest decision was taken um, more than a month ago, was obviously not a consideration. Coupled with that, the state, um, in our case the local authority, is under a duty to prevent deprivations of liberty and has positive obligations under Article 5. We know that a deprivation of liberty um, under the Dole's regime is only lawful if the best interest qualif qualifying requirement is met. And if the person's health and life is threatened by continuing to live in a congregated care facility, someone should be making a Section 21A uh, application to the Court of Protection. Um, and in my view, um, the Dole's team in every local authority should be actively going through their list and trying to get people out of care homes those which have not yet been infected. It won't be possible for everyone, but for some people it will be possible to get people out. Um, that task of going through the list of people under dolls and making every effort to get people out is a task that will save lives. Advocates can initiate Section 21A applications, but they're now not going in. Families can initiate them too, but they're not visiting or not being allowed to visit and may not have the tools um, to get their loved one out. So this is really an area where lawyers can step in and um, provide that legal support. Moving on to um, another issue in relation to care homes, and that's visits. Um, obviously, visits engage Article 8 of the ECHR, where we have to uh, scrutinise the proportionality. Um, and the CPT has said that any restrictions on contact with the outside world should be compensated for by an increased access to alternative means of communication like telephone or web-based communication. Uh, Michel Bachelet has said that, um, that you could set up expanded video conferencing, uh, phone calls with family members and permit email. Again, it's not going to be possible in every care home and for everyone, but it does seem to be happening in many care homes. Um, and the one care home in Madrid, which has not had a COVID-19 um, infection or death has a dedicated member of staff with an iPad going around full time um, and uh, facilitating communication between residents and their loved ones. Of course, disinfecting the iPad very carefully um, between each use. Uh, many will know that there's been already been a court of protection case about um, coronavirus and visits, um, and we've had some success trying to convince. Uh, NHS trusts to change their policies and last week NHS England on the 8th of March changed its policy. Um, the wording is slightly clunky there, it's their wording not mine, saying that um, supporting someone with a mental health issue such as dementia or a learning disability uh, it's okay to visit if, if you're supporting someone with a learning disability or mental health issue but someone needs to tell the um, NHS England staff that a learning disability is not a mental health issue but um, we pick our battles. Uh, last topic in relation to congregated care, um, monitoring. Uh, I won't go through the international law, you've got the references there, 
all this is to say that the Care Quality Commission, which for those of you not in England, that's the regulator and inspectorate, um, announced on 16th of March that it was stopping routine inspections, um, apart from a small number of cases where there are allegations of abuse. Um, however, the, the CPT have said that um, monitoring remains an essential uh, safeguard against ill treatment and should, um, should continue. Uh, with, of course, the um, monitors, the inspectors taking the necessary precautions. Um, so there's a doubt uh, in my mind as to whether the UK um, is now uh, in breach of its obligations under the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture and the CRPD, Article 16.3, which sets out the obligation on states to carry out these inspections. Final human rights topic, discrimination in healthcare. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. There's been a lot in the media recently. I think that most of the issues with regard to the potential um, disability-based discrimination have been now solved, but there are some resources uh, there. So what I want to do, um, moving very swiftly onwards, is just um, look at uh, how to use these international standards in UK litigation or, or legal advocacy which may not result in litigation. Um, so my advice is that it's fine to use soft law and guidance um, to bolster any argument that you're trying to make, uh, whether that's an argument grounded in UK common law, whether it's a public law um, argument about reasonableness or, um, or otherwise, uh, and in particular, um, there have been several cases where international human rights standards have been used to bolster ECHR arguments. Um, an example of a court um, referring to some of these standards is Mr Justice Hayden, quite recently in that contact case, visiting case that I, I mentioned. Um, he, in that judgment, cited both the CRPD and the CPT Statement of Principles. Um, and the CPT statement of principles, I think, is key um, because note that it uses the word must. Um, so WHO guidelines on fighting the pandemic, as well as the national guidelines, which uh, meet the international guidelines, must be respected and implemented fully in all places of detention. Um, I, I think that in any case where you're dealing with anyone in the care home or a psychiatric hospital, refer to the CPT guidelines because that's a route into um, Article 3. Um, last week, Maria Buric, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, issued quite a nice publication on human rights and coronavirus. And this is what she said in relation to Articles 2 and 3 of the ECHR. She said these provisions may be invoked in respect of severely ill patients, people with disabilities or elderly persons, and that their exposure to the disease at an extreme level of suffering may be found incompatible with the state's positive obligations to protect life and prevent ill treatment. It's almost <clears throat> as if she's encouraging lawyers to urgently litigate these cases. She was men mentioning that in respect to, of those two articles, but of course, other provisions of the European Convention will be relevant, Article 8, clearly in many cases, and Article 14, the right to uh, non-discrimination. Um, uh, just as a reminder for the, those in the UK, um, there is no suspension of convention rights. Um, all of the ECHR provisions remain in place. The Coronavirus Act doesn't budge them. Local authorities still must provide care and support in the community. If without that care, there would be a breach of the convention. There's plenty of case law from the um, ECHR where it's used um, CPD standards. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna go, go through uh, those cases now. But please, please, if you're using international um, instruments, please use and cite the CRPD. Um, there's a lot in the convention and the CRPD committee now has a rich jurisprudence. I'm very happy to advise and discuss if you're thinking about um, raising the CRPD in any litigation. A summary of this slide, is that the CRPD doesn't have the same status as the ECHR in the UK. Um, so you can use it as an aid to the interpretation of the ECHR. Um, and if you want to um, go on a lockdown geek out, if you like this subject, then 
get a copy of the book, which is at the bottom of the slide there. Um, Anna Lawson and Lucy series have written a chapter in that book on how UK courts have used the CRPD. Um, and if you're a super geek, you can read the chapter which I wrote about how the European Court of Human Rights um, has used the CRPD. So um, there's a wide, there's a whole array of possible legal challenges um, that might be taken to advance the rights of people with uh, disabilities. Some of this legal action needs to be developed extremely quickly um, and taken now, um, and others won't be possible, it won't be possible to take other types of cases. And of course, some of the themes there on the right hand side will um, unfortunately not, in my view, be subject to litigation, but will, will be lines of questioning um, in an eventual inquiry. And again, I stress, I'm not suggesting that litigation is going to solve this huge public health crisis, but I am saying that a human rights approach has the potential to highlight um, the gaps in service provision and to guide policy makers. So I'd like to finish um, with the words of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina de Vandas, one of the many female human rights leaders I've mentioned, who said that people with disabilities, quote, deserve to be reassured that their survival is a priority, end quote. So I know that many people um, on this Zoom call today are lawyers, family members, advocates, and leaders in the disability rights and the um, elder rights communities who have been advocating for equality and inclusion of people with disabilities for many years and who are now stepping up to ensure that the survival of people with disabilities is at least your priority. Um, many of you are grappling with the myriad uh, of complexities and tragedies that um, is thrown at us by this horrific disease and its economic, social and cultural consequences, which we've only started seeing. Um, so thank you very much for the work that you're doing and thank you for joining uh, this call. 